So I'm going to be rigging this character to test an auto rigger plugin that I'm working on. This is testing a version of the plugin that is in a limited state. I have prototyped the entire plugin, and this is the start of a more finalized version of the plugin. The character itself is a very basic animation test and practice character. This will allow me to have a more focused test than testing an entire rig. As for the rig itself, I'm trying to build an intermediate rig at the moment. The rig is primarily a game rig, so I'm not building in more advanced features like split knees. I want to keep this rig reasonably performant. The auto rigger will start with an interface node. This will generate the base guide for the rig, and it will also allow us to build the rig. At the start of the HDA, we'll have the options for setting up the character. After this, we'll have options for preset characters as well as adding limbs to those rigs. First, I'll set a path for my character guide. I'll install this in my project folder. I'll create a folder here for the rig. I can also create a folder for the guide. However, in this case, I'll store both the rig and the guide in a single folder. This folder will be called char. The auto rigger scripts will create individual HDAs for each character. We could use more generalized HDAs, but creating individual HDAs for each character means that the HDAs will not accidentally be overwritten. This will make it safer to modify and customize the individual characters. The naming system has been set up to work with namespaces and versions. We'll start out with name for the character. In this case, I'm going to give him a very banal generic name, so I'll call him Ballman. We will then have the author, and we'll have the branch. These kind of naming conventions, of course, depend on the project you're setting up. In this case, my branch will be test rigs. We will then have the version numbers for the rig. In this case, we are starting, so this will be version one. The results should be a properly namespaced and version name and a properly namespaced and version type for the character. This name will be for the HDA we create for the guide for the character, not the HDA for the final rig itself although most of the options for the final rig will be set with these settings by default. After the name options, we will have our presets. These will give us preset rig configurations. These will be followed by individual libs that we can use to build the rig or add to an existing rig. For the presets, I have a couple of default options planned. We will of course have a default for the humanoid, as well as a couple of defaults for quadrupeds. I also have basic setups for spiders, and for flying creatures like bats and birds. In this case, however, we'll be using the most basic form of the rig, and this will be called the base rig. This is the minimum starting setup for a guide. This will generate the guide network for us. I'll enter this. First, we have a node for setting up the mesh for the rig. The mesh that we receive from a modeler may not be ideally placed for rigging. I will use this node to make minor adjustments as well as separate rigid and deformable geometry. I will start by referencing my geometry. I have set up this geometry to not be ideal. In this case, we have the feet facing outwards, and it is usually better if the feet are facing directly forward. The main reason to reposition the character, however, is to have ideal hip placement, and this character's hip placement should be perfect by default. This node does not scale the character. I've not set up either the rig or the guide to scale the characters. This is because I prefer objects to be scaled at the object level and not at the SOP level. And that is entirely apart from the fact that scaling introduces unnecessary complexity to rigs. If we want to introduce squash and stretch to characters, scaling is not the best way to do it. There are a lot of other ways to do this, and especially when it comes to deformation, as this is Houdini's specialty. In either case, cartoony deformation is not a focus of this rig currently. That will give us our basic mesh. Next, we'll have the main part of our guide, which is the skeleton. This node will have a custom HDA, which is generated from our name parameters. There are a couple of ways which we can add limbs to the skeleton. First, we can do this directly using the interface node. We should be able to add most of the limbs to any other limb with a couple of exceptions regarding the hands and the feet. We do not have to use the interface, however. We can also use a radial menu. This will have most of the limbs divided into sub-menus. For example, we have the head, 
And for most of the limbs, we'll have options where we can either add them as individual limbs or as pairs. In this case, the character will need legs. I'll then select the joint which they need to be attached to. We should now have a pair of legs for this character. I can activate the skeleton in the viewport and I'll be able to move these joints. We can position these joints symmetrically. These can, however, also be manipulated asymmetrically. However, in this case, the character is symmetrical. I'll position these joints in the orthographic viewport. I can then add feet to the legs. The feet can either be added as individual feet or as a symmetrical asymmetrical pair. In this case, I'll use a symmetrical pair. I can then position the joints for the feet appropriately. The setup will contain the bones for the feet. It will also contain the pivot points for the feet. We'll have pivots for the blades of the feet and the heel. We'll also have a pivot for the ball of the foot. So this will give us the basic skeleton. Then we'll separate the skeleton from the controls and generate any extra control geometry we need. We'll also generate basic control templates here. We'll then have the initial weights generated. And we'll have basic proxy geometry created. Then we'll have a node which will allow us to export the rig. This will allow us to export any of the rig geometry separately. We can also generate two rig networks. The one will be a paint network. This will allow us to work on the weights for the geometry separately from generating the geometry for the rig. This will allow me to keep this network neat and not have to change any parts of this network. It will also allow me to work in weight paints where the weights are not being regenerated constantly. The other network is a rig network which will generate the rig for the character. So these are three networks. We'll take a look at the paint network now. This will provide a base network which I can use to start painting the weights. In this rig, for example, we don't really need a lot of blending between weights. And in fact, most of the character can be bound rigidly. I am currently getting more deformation than I do want. So I'll paint the weights now and we can take a look at the main rig later. Since the limbs in this rig are going to be bound rigidly, I'll use capture override nodes instead of painting the weights. And I'll do this for all of the main limbs. We'll now take a look at the rig itself. For the rig, we have an IK setup and an FK setup. We can toggle the visibility on both of these. At the moment, this FK setup is very basic. I may set up compensation systems for gimbal lock in the future, but at the moment, I'm leaving this as a minimal FK. So for the rig itself, we have multiple display options. We can display the mesh itself. We can display the raw proxies. We can display the skeleton and we can display the skeletal animation. So the animation option will give us the animation rig. All the others will give us the raw data from the rig. I have elected not to display the final animation from within this node. This will give us lighter and faster skeletal animation. The deformation itself will be displayed through a display node. And this will allow us to see the deformed mesh or the proxy geometry. This allows us to separate the deformation of the final mesh from the animation of the character and provides a more flexible approach. As you can see, I was weighting things quickly and I was rather sloppy, so I'll need to fix the weights. I'll return to the paint node. I'll update the weights and then I'll re-export the mesh. So I've updated the weights and now we have a better deformation for the leg. So with this display node, we have the deformed mesh, or we have the proxies. I haven't finished updating the proxies properly. I'll just reload the original proxies. These proxies are currently automatically generated, so they're not necessarily the most beautiful proxy geometry, but they will give us a more efficient interaction with the rig. 
Next we can take a look at some of the features of the rig. I have already stated that the FK controls are rather basic, so we'll take a look at the IK controls instead. The first parameters will be for my hips. The hips will be driven by the centre of gravity, but there are a number of controls that we can use to modify the hip behaviour apart from the centre of gravity. A lot of these do not have a huge amount of purpose in this specific rig, but in more general rigs they are very useful. The first one of these will be our hips pivot. This is currently not visible. This is not something which you'd want to animate with that often, and it's not something which you'd want to move around a lot either. We will look at that after we've looked at the main controls. We have our center of gravity, and this will control our basic rotation and translation for the hips. This will also give us a global control over most of the other hip controls. We then have an independent rotation control. We then have a third rotation control that we'll look at a little bit later. Before that, we'll look at our hips pivot control. I've set the display of the translation and the rotation for this to be separate. You do not generally actively want to animate the pivot of the hips. You will generally use this to set a position for the offset, and then you'll animate the rotation. This will allow us to animate the hip based off a pivot point. Generally, we'll set this up to use as a pivot from the waist. This is also why we have a separate rotation control. The second rotation control will allow us to fine-tune a rotation of the hips after we've rotated from the pivot point. The second rotation control also contains two forms of rotation. We have a default axes-based rotation, which is what I've shown so far. We can also use a look at rotation setup. This gives a different way of rotating the hips, and can in some ways be more intuitive than a standard rotation. More importantly, this will allow us to compensate for gimbal lock. So if there's gimbal lock for the main rotation, we can set the rotation parameters individually with this. And look at rotations are generally not as susceptible to gimbal lock as standard rotations are. The biggest disadvantage to using these controls as a rotation driver is that you have to animate two controls instead of one control. But the fact that they use translations can make the curves easier to deal with. Overall, this will give us quite a few options for tweaking the rotation of the hips. So we can switch between the display of these to either use the full rotation or to use the look at rotation. We can also display both of these at the same time so that we can see both forms of rotation simultaneously. Next, we have a control for the orientation of the hips with relation to the legs. This is a control which is not easy to show in this rig, as this will work best when we have a spine. This will allow us to control the orientation of the hips where they attach to the legs, separately from the orientation of the actual hip control. This will have more use when we have other limbs attached to the rig. The most obvious would be a spine. This will allow us to separate the movement of the spine from the movement of the hips, which can be very useful especially for things like dancing. This control will also be hidden, as its use is for very specific cases. I'll now look at the foot setup. We have our leg control, and this will drive the main rotation of the foot. We then have a pivot for the ball of the foot. We are also able to pivot the foot from the heel. We have the pivots from the blade of the foot, both for the inner and the outer. We have the ability to raise or lower our toe. This is one of the controls which I may replace with a slider in the future, as a slider can be more intuitive here. We can then pivot the foot from the toe, and this pivot will be based off the position of the toe, it will not be a world position pivot. We then have the rotation for the center of the foot. Next we can take a look at the legs. We have straightforward IK FK controls for the legs. We are also able to match the FK controls to those of the IK. We can also do the opposite in that we can match the IK controls to the position of the FK controls. The legs also have standard controls like stretching and IK FK blending. We also have various space switching options for the legs. Currently, we're doing this in the space of the skeleton, and we can do this in the space of the skeleton in either object or world position. This means that the first priority will be for the controls to follow the position of the joints of the skeleton, 
And then whether we are evaluating the hierarchy from a parent position or from a world position will be decided. This means that our controls will follow existing animation, such as motion capture. To show this, I'll set up a quick motion capture network. I've added motion capture for a basic walk, and the motion capture is now driving the animation. This motion capture is from Mixamo. If we look at the animation for the rig, we'll see that the rig is modifying the motion capture, as this motion capture is altered based off the positioning of the foot. This allows us to animate over the motion capture. It also allows us to re-rig our animation easily. The skeleton world will allow us to animate the controls in world space after the motion capture. In practice, this doesn't have a huge effect for the legs. This does, however, have more influence as the rig gets more complex. We can also set this control to follow the hips after the motion capture has been calculated. We can also set this joint strictly according to world space. This will bypass motion capture and will give us a closed chain IK for the leg. If we do not have motion capture plugged in, we should have the same result from our skeleton world space. The other option is to have the motion inherit directly from the hips, also bypassing any motion capture. I have not made this automatically retain the position of the leg. This is because we can easily retain these positions by matching the IK and the FK, and this provides a more flexible option overall, although I am setting up options to toggle that behavior in later versions of the rig. Having the leg controls parented to the hips will give us an open chain IK behavior, and this will allow us to have the legs follow the main body of the skeleton. There are also parenting controls for the up vectors, where we can have them parented globally or parented to the hips or the feet, and that will give us the main functionality of the legs at the moment. This is a rather bare bones setup, and I do plan to add options like mirroring the controls, but it doesn't provide the base functionality for the legs. There is one more main feature for this rig, and that is that we have a rudimentary pose library set up for the character. I can scan to see if there is a library. Since we have no library folder, I can add it. This will, of course, be done at the specified library path. I can enter a pose name, and I'll call this neutral. The pose can then be saved using the Save Pose button. I can then activate the rig, and I'll pose the character. Seems I have another joint which I didn't wait properly as I was waiting things too quickly. I will fix this quickly. I will continue posing the rig. For the moment, I'll call this Pose 1. This is not a good name, but it will work for demonstration. Under my Pose options, we'll see that there are options None and Neutral. I can save this pose and it should now show up under the options as well. I'll set the pose to neutral, and I can now load this pose. This will return us to our initial pose. I'll set the pose to be pose one, and I can now return to that position. So this is a very basic pose library, but it is functional. So this is the basic autorigger setup for my legs, and it'll give me a functional ball rig character.